Oggi appunto vi parlo Today I'm going to talk about my PhD research which finished last year. In my PhD work I compared the history of remembrance of four former concentration and transit camps in Italy and France. I four I chose four case studies because of some similarities between them and also some difference between them in uh, analyzing the history and the procedures through which these uh, camps changed. The four camps are Nazweiler Strutfo in Alsace, which I compared to the Reserva di San Salva in Trieste, then the camp of Fossoli, which you all know, and the camp of Transi, which is close to Paris. Today it's going to be very difficult to analyze uh, all the four cases in detail. What I'd like to do is to try and give you some ideas uh, and some questions uh, that me myself also posed myself in this research, which uh, have often been mentioned and posed again during these uh, days of conference. In other words, first question, what is a transit camp? What is a concentration camp? Can we define that through the form? Uh, through the way it is represented and furthermore what meaning do these camps take on for collective memory for local memory and then finally what are these memorial sites for so in other words this is uh, still a very topical research question. The first uh, case study I'm going to talk about is the Rizier di San Sabba. Many of you might be familiar with its history uh, for the sake of uh, 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 shortness. I'm going to focus on these places alone. With uh, operations in the Adriatic, the uh, SS decided to use this industrial facility, which was uh, a rice producing company in Trieste, in the Servola um, quarter, as a polizai haftlager, so as a police detention lager. So there was an area in which the Jews were interned and then deported to the north, to the concentration, camp, concentration camps in the north, and also a place in which Slovenian, Croatian and Italian partisans were interned and tortured and many of them unfortunately also killed. The first memorial site that was uh, built uh, beyond the oblivion that you may register, that you may record on this issue, was um, built in the autumn of 1944, 45, sorry. It is a very small memorial site, it has a cross, and this cross is actually an element that has to be found in all the first memorial sites uh, created in these camps. And what's interesting to note is that it is basically vis-a-vis -vis in front of the big damage caused by the fall of the chimney on the building of the rice factory. As Francesca said this morning, the camp was used as a refugee camp. And in this picture you can see one of the tunnels that was completely repainted. And you see also uh, some words, some kind of a plate above. Thanks to Diego de Enriquez, uh, who was a collector of war objects, a very eccentric personality from Trieste, today we still have the living uh, uh, evidence of uh, these of some areas of the rice factory. Enriquez actually entered the place before the transformation, before the camp was transformed into a refugee camp, and then he collected these writings. And then Claudio Magris wrote uh, that uh, on those walls and on the assumed names written there, in peace times, uh, people, I mean, those walls had been painted. After war, you have peace, and actually peace has a white color of uh, tombstones. Romano Boico, in 1966, the municipality of Trieste actually issued, uh, published a call for proposals for the creation there of a museum for the resistance, and then in 1965, the camp had been proclaimed 
as a historical national memorial uh, site. And the winner of that uh, competition was an architect from Trieste. He visited the place, he knew the place, and so in his projects, uh, he decided uh, uh, to take a number of uh, measures. And this is actually, this is a picture of the first uh, uh, project. And he wrote about this project that uh, uh, actually I have other doubts. Uh, and sometimes uh, I also have fear, the fear of building a monument which is not against violence. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in a memorial site to this uh, factory, he tried to eliminate uh, the iron elements that would uh, be present on the windows in order to show the misery of that place, a place that had been turned from a factory into a concentration camp, a place of suffering. And then also the absence of symbols inside the place makes this even more uh, serious. I mean, this uh, building was uh, very severe. The museum was inaugurated on 24th of April 1974 in the presence of the authorities and in the presence of uh, civil authorities. And in the same period, uh, the trial to the Nazi criminals who had worked there opened. And in this picture, you see a witness, a former uh, internee, Jaime Wachsberger, and then on the other side, you see Augusta Reis. She was the SS interpreter inside the camp. Today, this is the look of the place. You enter the place by going through that corridor, by walking that corridor. You have uh, high reinforced concrete walls surrounding it. And then you reach this internal yard, this courtyard. And the architect here decided to highlight the place where the uh, crematory would be, uh, the crematory that was used during the camp. This is how the museum looks like today. Uh, the first museum uh, pathway was conceived in 1982, and this one, this picture, refers to 19 uh, to 2016. So today's uh, uh, project basically brings this place in line with European memorial sites, and visitors are facilitated in their understanding of how the place was before it was turned into the uh, Museum of Remembrance. Now, let us talk about Fossoli. The first monument that was uh, made in Fossoli was made in 1955, and that's during the commemoration days uh, for the 10 years after the liberation, and on the occasion of the itinerant exhibition on Lagos that Marcia Lupi mentioned uh, yesterday. Citizens uh, had the chance to see a number of uh, uh, images on the Nazi camps. This was fundamental in order to understand how the camps were. The uh, museum uh, and memorial site for the deportee was made, was created in 1973. You will probably have the chance to visit it tomorrow. And this is a very interesting mixture between architecture art, it also induces to a thoughtful reflection on the condition of a political and racial deportees. As a matter of fact, there are also a lot of sentences taken from the lectors of those who, were, who had been condemned to death. This museum was commented uh, by a number of authors like Ludovico Balbiano de, di Belgioioso, who wrote uh, that the fact that I personally participated in, in this moment and I was a victim of this moment uh, and that I saved my life for a number of factors which were really a miracle induced me to address the issue of deportation, deportations as an architect as well as a person who, thanks to architecture, can live again a fundamental moment of its history. In 1988, uh, as uh, Lucaroni uh, reminded some time ago, an international conference for the transformation of the fossil camp into a, a camp for remembrance. And Roberto Maestro, the architect from Florence, Roberto Maestro, won the competition. 
realizzo un progetto he um, sort molto, of uh, uh, poetico, possiamo dire. He created a very poetic project. Uh, he defines himself uh, uh, as an architect who works on tissue paper, uh, with tissue paper. His uh, uh, works are very close to literature. He makes uh, oftentimes reference to literature. And in this case, actually, the project remained on paper. The project would, however, profoundly change the face of Fossoli. And it was ultimately not built. See, the issue of how we can maintain the camp alive and how we can, in a way, intervene on the, on the sheds. I also worked on Natzweiler Struthof, uh, which is in Altus. This camp was used up to the end of 1944, so it was active between 1940 and 1944. A first cross was placed soon after the end of the war. And this cross uh, is also found uh, in a different area that was, you know, in the memorial site was inaugurated in 1960. Here it was the, K, the state which sort of uh, uh, imposed itself on the creation of the memorial and the project was entrusted to Bertrand Muni. He was a state architect. The memorial site was built there and inaugurated in 1960. This is the big tower on the National Cemetery, which can be seen from the back. And here you see it better from these pictures. This is a memorial site which is greatly impactful, which basically represented the memory of the French resistance movement. At the time, there was a much bigger and stronger mm, remembrance of the camp. I mean, you could perceive the European dimension of this. Out of the 52,000 deputies in this camp, many of them came from many, many different countries, but most of them came from Poland, and there were also Soviet prisoners. Only a part of them, only a minority of them were uh, the deputies of the French resistance. A first museum was organized in 1965. Here you see some pictures, however, the pictures are recent pictures. So a shed was recovered and a small museum was made from it. This European dimension of the camp was then recognized with the opening of the Centre European de Resistance de Proté in 2005. This is how the camp looks like today. There are only a few sheds uh, which were uh, renovated, uh, restructured, and the rest was completely demolished uh, during the building of the memorial site between the 1950s and the 1960s. An important uh, witness, Boris Parov, who had been interned in the camp, uh, uh, actually talked about a walk through the uh, shades and he basically said that well yes I liked and I quote that the French uh, would take care of those uh, areas but at the same time my soul would uh, rebel against uh, those uh, actions uh, not so much for the color that they used because I knew that the workers would have uh, in a way repainted the old boards uh, but I couldn't stand the presence of those pieces of wood restored. It, it was as if uh, there had been someone who were trying to, in a way, inoculate fresh living cells uh, into a dead body, as if you would, in a way, uh, implant uh, a white leg into dead bodies. And now I can no longer tell the added places. So the evil has, in a way, eaten up whole new cells. Now, the last case, the last case at the Drancy. Speakers before me have said that in 1976, the first memorial site was the one of Shalom Monselinje, a former deputy and Polish Jew who was born 
uh, near Oswiecim in Poland who had uh, been uh, deported to Drancy with his family and he was the only survivor of his family. He then got a scholarship to come to Paris and there he became a sculptor. This is a monument he made. This monument is basically uh, the quorum for public prayer with lots of references to the Jewish culture and you see a lot of uh, phases uh, expressed by the memorial site and actually he says that also the face of his mother and his uh, uh, sister can be seen from the sculpture. This is a picture of the sculptor who is still working on uh, wood uh, and granite uh, sculptures. In 1988, a wagon was added to that. It was added behind the monument uh, as uh, a memory for the deportations. And then in the same year, the Conservatoire Historique du Camp was opened. That was the first pedagogical experience in Drancy. In 2012, uh, the Memorial de Drancy was uh, created uh, and also the Memorial of the Shoah. And this is actually the glass window that makes it possible to see the Cite de la Muette with a historical exhibition and uh, a teaching uh, a museum pathway. Uh, some remarks by Anna Eglefeu uh, are interesting in this respect, and I'm going to quote from her. And actually, she she deals with uh, she works as a guide in the museum, and she said that there's a before and an after of the memorial. When there was no real place to visit, you would go directly to the site. But now you have this building, which is a monumental building, and I think the building should be used to, in a way, lighten up inhabitants uh, of the presence of visitors in the place, because this is no longer justifiable, because you have this very large glass window. This is, these are her words, and this shows that the site is really very interesting. It is today a place of remembrance, but it is also a place where people live, and there are implications, a number of important implications uh, in realizing memorial sites like this. Uh, I would like to conclude by posing a question, by asking a question which might sign, sound naive, but it isn't. So what are monuments for today? How do we interact with these spaces? And as Mark Gottfried wrote in his uh, book, Abstraction and the Holocaust, is it still true that these places create a space within which we can stop, we abandon the haste of our daily life and we stop to, in a way, think about the history they tell us. Thank you very much.